Welcome to Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. We all know that bees produce honey and that a bee sting is no fun. But what else do you know about them? Did you know that they pollinate a large proportion of the plants that supply our food? Today's guest will tell us about these critically important players in our food chain. Brian Dykstra is a Eugene-based researcher and educator interested in bees, pollination, and human relationships with them. He has been an agricultural extension research assistant, farmer, field botanist, greenhouse manager, blogger, and teacher. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Lee. I'm glad to participate in a volunteer effort like community television. <laughs> We're also glad to be participating in this volunteer effort. <laughs> so. You're going to tell us all about bees, everything that we wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask. Is that right? Yeah, hopefully, you know, <laughs> if I can do a brief synopsis in this approximately hour long show, uh, I'll try to incorporate as much as I can so we can learn more about bees. I, I'm sure it's going to be very informative. So um, I know that you have a lot of pictures to show us, uh, so I'll let you take this at your own pace, but you know, let's talk about bee diversity. Okay, thanks, Lee. Um, We'll talk about bee diversity. Uh, we're going to talk about the um, ways that bees pollinate plants. And we're going to talk about the problems that bees face. And we're also going to talk about solutions um, that we can work on for uh, maintaining our wild bee and uh, domesticated or uh, managed bees um, and keeping them healthy. So that's going to be the structure of the talk. Great. But um, in this hour, I'm going to make sure we redraw our map of what honeybees are. And so we can look at this slide here. Um, it's a little comedic. Uh, we have a slide of uh, the map is not the territory. The idea with this saying, the map is not the territory, is that sometimes our mental maps don't reflect reality. Um, in, in other words, the world is much larger than the map we look at. Um, so often when we think of bees, we think of certain things. For example, if I ask you, what do you think about when I mention the word bees, Lee, what's something that comes to mind? I think of flowers, honey, and busy. Yeah, yeah, and flowers are so important to uh, most bees out there. In fact, almost all bees uh, need those flowers. Um, there are uh, other qualities of bees that come to mind. Often people think of them living in hives, very social, um, getting stung by them, beekeeping. We think of people wearing uh, bee suits, etc. Mm -hmm. And we also start thinking about uh, colony collapse disorder or that bees are in trouble. So that's another part of our mental map um, that we have. So um, I, we have another slide. The reality is with, with bees um, is that this little roadmap we have, um, the honey, the stings, the beekeeping, the uh, colonies that they pollinate, CCD, it's a simplified version and um, that we use to navigate and understand um, both our problems and the solutions for them. But it has a few blind spots. And the next slide you can see that actually very few bees actually make honey. Um, most bees don't make honey at all. Most bees also don't even nest in hives, as you see. Um, wow, less than 3%. Mm -hmm. um, and there are bees that are social, but most bees are actually solitary bees. And I'll talk about what solitary means. Um, but it, most bees, um, while they can sting, it's only the females that can sting. And there are about 15% of bees that do not have stingers at all. Some stings of some bees are painful and others are much less so. Um, but most bees are pollinators and most bees um, are uh, threatened by certain activities that we uh, participate in as humans in agriculture um, and uh, in other areas of human life. So all, all bees are susceptible to things that we do as a uh, society. And the fact that only females can sting probably has to do with the division of labor among bees, the meaning females would be in charge of defending uh, the other bees. And so they would need to be able to sting. Is that right? Um, mostly, uh, I mean, the reason is that uh, the stinger is actually a modified ovipositor, so the, uh, the, an egg-laying structure. So because male bees don't have, um, never had an ovipositor mm -hmm. uh, in evolutionary history, uh, they didn't have anything that evolved into a stinger. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's completely different from what I thought. That's interesting. But it does relate to the uh, activities of bees uh, in, a, in a gender, uh, re gender specific way. Mm -hmm. um, but there are uh, a variety of ways that um, bees defend their hives outside of stinging. Mm -hmm. um, we also, um, 
should focus on what solitary bees are before we okay. move forward. Okay. So I have a slide here that shows uh, um, redrawing our map, actually. So social versus solitary, most bees being solitary, and I'll get into that. Um, but they have a variety of foraging ranges. Honeybees and bumblebees can go for miles, whereas most uh, bees actually go much uh, smaller distances, um, sometimes only 100 meters. Uh, nesting substrate, some bees nest in the ground. That's about 70% of bees. Um, some bees make their hives in trees. Others uh, will make their uh, nesting structure uh, inside of a snail shell even, uh, or in pine cones. So it can really vary. And the sensitivity to pesticides varies. So this side view here uh, the, the shows the topographical complexity of this road defining solutions and examining the problems facing bees. It's, it's a diverse uh, world and it isn't very straightforward or simple. Um, so bees emerge at different times of the year in spring versus uh, middle of summer versus even uh, late summer um, and so on. Um, the next slide shows some um, what we think of as a, uh, the honeybee. Uh, when we think of bees we think of the um, honeybee and this is the face of honeybees. Now uh, Marla Sp Spivak uh, who is a graduate of Humboldt State University, uh, and she teaches at... I, I'm not laughing at you. I'm uh -huh. thinking this is only a face, this is a face that only a mother could love. <laughs> this is not right. a pretty creature. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Dr. 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 Spivak, who's a uh, bee researcher uh, and professor at the uh, University of Minnesota, um, says we should look at bees as a mirror. Um, in other words, there's, <laughs> there's, there's something to reflect here. But when, we, but when we redraw the map to include the diversity of bees, and the next slide you can see here, um, actually, when we look at the mirror, the diverse um, types of bees, the diversity, the, and the uniqueness of bees is something that we should reflect on as well. Um, now, bees nest in a, a variety of um, uh, nesting substrates. And on the next slide here, you can see that uh, this is a bee that nests in the ground. As I said, 70% of bees nest in the ground. Um, uh, and, and, but this is a solitary bee. So she is what uh, my professor liked to call a uh, solitary bee is a single hard-working mom. Um, mm -hmm. She does not have sisters or daughters that help her to collect the pollen. She is the only person to build the nest and um, in this case she's burrowed in the ground, she's collected pollen from flowers and she's made a little ball and then she's laid an egg on top of it. The egg will hatch, grow into a larva, pupate and turn into a, an adult and in most cases that takes uh, an entire year so the next spring or summer that bee will emerge and the baby bee doesn't get to see her mother. Um, very different. She's just on her own from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. yeah, but solitary doesn't mean that they're not friendly. Uh, often um, we can find large uh, gregarious populations of bees nesting in, 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 um, together in an area because the nesting substrate's uh, uh, perfect for them. Um, but even though they're in large numbers, they don't attack in numbers. So solitary bees are really unlikely to sting somebody um, because uh, they're not uh, dispensable. They're the only bee that will bring back food uh, for the, for the uh, young bees. What are some examples of solitary bees that we would have here in the Willamette Valley? Oh, uh, in North America, we have about uh, 4,000 native bees, and probably over 95% over of those are uh, solitary bees. Um, we have definitely mason bees, and a lot of people have heard of mason bees and leafcutter bees. Yeah, um, popular uh, to have as a, a backyard project for the kids, the mason bees. Right, yeah, all very unlikely to sting um, mm -hmm. people. Uh, and those are called cavity nesters. Often they're looking for uh, an empty uh, reed or uh, branch, you know, that they can carve the, uh, in some cases, carve the pith out. In other cases, they're looking for like uh, beetle burrows in wood that they can begin collecting the pollen and putting and storing away in there. Leaf cutter bees will actually use leaves. So I have some slides of, of uh, the different types of nests that these bees would use. Mm -hmm. And um, so on the upper left and on the lower right, you see social bees. Um, they've created uh, their hive out of wax and um, resin and uh, a combo of that called cerumen. Uh, and on the bottom left, you ha have a cellophane bee. That bee um, uses uh, its own secretions to make a waterproof kind of bag or cell around the pollen that it puts uh, in there and the, and the egg that it lays. And um, they're all, uh, often called uh, cellophane or polyester bees um, because, of, because of that. Um, basically, the pollen they collect, they, they leave it in a semi-liquid form. So 
it develops this uh, beneficial uh, microbiota uh, community, and that helps increase the uh, nutrition mm -hmm. for the baby bee. Um, so these kind of bees could be thought of as the originators of mead in some sense. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on the next slide you see here, um, you can see that some of these nests are hard to spot. So um, the, you, know, you can be looking at the ground and the, 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 the little hole that may look like an ant hole, a um, little burrow for yeah. a mouse even, um, could be a bee. I photographed this on the, on the coast. This is a dune-dwelling silver bee. And it's, uh, at that moment, it's building this little tunnel um, uh, to the under, underground zone. Um, on the next slide, you can see what um, some of these underground tunnels look like. Some can be quite deep and complex. And sometimes the bees will make multiple little loaves of pollen and nectar that they'll stock on top of each other to prevent water from getting in if they, if they can't make a waterproof uh, bag around it like the cellophane bees. Um, Do they typically have that little raised place over the entrance to the, the hole? I, it, they all look like little volcanoes it, up on top. It can vary. This is um, uh, Nomia melanderi, a, a drawing of a uh, local native uh, bee and from Washington and Northern Oregon, uh, the nest in semi-arid areas that does that. Um, some are a little harder to find. Mm -hmm. On the next slide, you can see that um, in my hand is, this is a uh, digger bee, the Anthophora bomboides, and this has been broken open. Uh, and you can see the cell there and the, the uh, pollen and nectar combined. And um, this is a local bee species that's great because it's a, an important pollinator. On the next slide, you can see uh, bees that make their nests out of wool, uh, not actual wool from sheep. They don't visit sheep. They're called wool carter bees because they actually collect trichomes from plants. Um, so this is a picture of a bee collecting the hairs of a uh, fuzzy leaf, and it will make a little uh, cell out of that and lay the egg on the pollen inside of there. We have some locally here, and I saw a lot visiting here in Eugene the uh, um, lamb's ears. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would make sense. In the next slide, we see the uh, carpenter bee, which carries its set of tools around <laughs> with her. Of course, uh, that is a Photoshop. Okay, so the next slide shows the actual carpenter bee. And carpenter bees, they nest, they actually will, can burrow through wood. And so they can, um, unless the wood is painted, they may see the wood as an opportunity to burrow right in. Uh, and these are uh, important pollinators of larger flowers that honeybees may not uh, affect the pollination of. Um, the next slide um, shows leaf cutter bees. Um, and you can see what they do is they make their nest out of leaf pieces that they cut in circles and ovals. Um, and they're looking for little spots to build a little cigar full of uh, uh, baby, uh, you know, eggs, eggs, baby bees uh, for the next year that will emerge. Um, we also have in this slideshow, the next slide, um, this is an orchid bee. Now this isn't from North America, um, but you can see the, the length of the tongue. Now the shape and length of the tongue of bees can really affect what flowers that they effectively uh, pollinate. And we do have uh, orchids here in Oregon, um, and they are uh, pollinated, some of them at least, by bees. And I'll get into that. The next slide. So I'm sorry, that, that one with the very long curled tongue specifically likes orchids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Often orchids are in the tropics are pollinated by male bees because they're collecting resin from the flowers. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Or floral volatiles. Um, here we see a bumblebee. This is the western bumblebee. It used to be the most common bumblebee on the west coast. And bumblebees nest in the ground, as you can see in the next slide. Um, often uh, they're building up their colonies. So, the, so this is an example of a native social bee. Uh, these bees will make their uh, honey pots out of wax and they will fill it with uh, uh, nectar that's been concentrated into honey and they will collect pollen and they uh, the queen will uh, basically emerge in the spring she's already made it in the fall uh, and she's overwintered by herself um, and they only store up uh, enough uh, honey to survive about three or four days um, since only the queen will overwinter they don't store up a lot of honey um, her, um, she'll start laying eggs and um, she'll start feeding her children and they will emerge uh, and begin to forage for her and thus the colony of the summer 
uh, begins and they'll bring back pollen and nectar for the eggs that she continues to lay. At some point, she won't need to forage anymore and all her daughters would do that work for her. Wow, that's a good arrangement, isn't it? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Um, we, uh, let's see, the next slide I have here is of uh, um, the hairs. So bees have something in, in common. They, 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 they like to visit flowers. They're vegetarian. The branched hairs they have, they're feather-like, allow the, the pollen to collect on them pretty easily. And um, and allows them to bring that pollen back home. And the hairs themselves can vary. Some have larger spaces between the different um, components mm -hmm. that allow larger pollen grains to stick easier. Mm -hmm. Some are closer together in some species of bees to allow um, smaller pollen grains to stick on there. Mm -hmm. um, so the type of hair on the bee can make a big impact on uh, the type of flowers that they can visit effectively. So that's one reason why there would be differently flavored honeys because the bees have gone after a particular flower with a particular size of pollen, I suppose. Well, European honeybees um, it was where we, we typically get honey from. Um, and in the international market, uh, honey is pretty much limited to, uh, the definition of honey is pretty much limited, uh, except for in a few instances, to European honeybees. Um, and they have the same kind of right. spacing between the hairs. Um, okay. Although right. they can visit different flowers and that does affect the type of honey they, they make. Um, I, I keep forgetting that honey producing bees are actually the minority. Yeah. yeah, you know, but, um, you know, Christopher Columbus, who was operating without a map regarding bees or, the, you know, the New World, uh, he arrived in the uh, Car Caribbean and at gunpoint uh, robbed uh, the native peoples of uh, honey and beeswax they had in their homes. Um, so there were, and it are, bee beekeeping and wild honey uh, collecting activities uh, that are traditional and South and Central America. Um, in North America, we don't have honey producing bees other than bumblebees per se, but they don't make enough for humans to uh, focus on collecting them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there is a variety of bees that make honey, but the European honeybee uh, has a certain type of uh, hair that, <laughs> that does make it a little harder for them to collect certain pollens like squash, you know, compared to squash bees, which have hairs. Uh, they're designed right. for collecting the large grains right. of uh, squash pollen, which, <laughs> yeah. I think I've got a, another slide here um, that shows uh, different types of uh, pollen collecting uh, apparatus that, apparatus that bees have. So on the left, you see a honeybee. On the right, you see a bumblebee. Both have what are called pollen baskets. So uh, while the pollen collects on these hairs of the bees, they will then move it to a new location. And this is uh, on these social bees, they move it to a pollen basket. And that is a relatively hairless region fringed uh, by longer hairs. Um, before they move it, though, as you can see in this next slide, they, um, oh, here we go. This slide shows after the, the pollen has been moved, you can see it's very well packed. It's very well packed. You mm -hmm. may have heard the uh, saying, uh, that's the bee's knees, which is yeah. uh, it's kind of saying, like, that's the height of excellence. You yeah, could also say it means yeah. that's pretty cute, but um, it's, it was often used for uh, meaning the height of excellence. Well, if you look closely at this next slide, the bee's knees, that is um, between two segments of their, uh, uh, between two portions of their leg segments, here you have a pollen press that kind of crushes the pollen and presses it together, often mixed with just a little nectar. And they do that before they pop it back up into their pollen basket, um, which you see is above the pollen press there on the left. On the right, you see a bunch of uh, bee pollen like you might find in the store. And those are all uh, uh, pollen, um, a group, uh, an agglomeration of pollen that has been pressed by the honeybee and then popped up into their pollen basket. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the way it is on the bee before it's removed. But compared to most other bees, if you look at this next slide, uh, most other bees have a different type of structure for collecting pollen. On the left and on the right, you see these arrows pointing towards extremely hairy regions. Uh, so these are not um, a pollen basket. These are actually called uh, pollen brooms. Uh, the word for them, actually, a scientific word, is uh, each one is called a scopa, which is an Italian word for broom. And so these are long um, groups of hairs, groups of long hairs that the, uh, the bees will push the pollen into and be so they can take it home. Um, on the right, that bee has been collecting um, pollen from flowers. On the left, that one has not. Now, a lot of these high-quality photos, I should thank the uh, United States Geological uh, Survey um, 
bee inventory and monitoring lab that makes them available online. Um, Sam Drogi has done a good job photographing our native bees here in North America as well as bees from around the world. And uh, those are free use photos and they're, they, they show these uh, aspects of bee biology quite beautifully. Great. And so here we're, we're beginning to talk about pollen, so we're going to start talk, talking about pollination itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I have this picture there on the left is of a lily plant and that I took in southwest Oregon. And you've probably had a lily sitting in a vase on your desk and you've seen the pollen fall down, you know, or onto yes. your table. Yes. Uh, the pollen is readily available. Um, of course, if that pollen lands on, um, the pollen is considered a fem or the male part of a flower. Um, because it, it act, they actually, the, each pollen grain contains sperm. Mm -hmm. um, so the, when the pollen lands on the female part of a flower, that's called pollination. And so um, we often think of bees as great pollinators, and they are for a lot of our agricultural crops and our wildflowers. Mm -hmm. On the next slide, you see another type of flower. Uh, this is a rhododendron. And the pollen isn't readily available. It's actually this, this anther, which is what holds the pollen, is a little bit like a salt or a pepper shaker. It has holes on the end, and these pores are where the pollen must exit. It doesn't split like a seam in the middle and open wide. So this pollen is a little harder to access. Now, for some bees, like honeybees, that, um, that if they visit these flowers, they can get the nectar, but it's harder for them to collect the pollen because it's not readily available. Um, some bees can visit and collect both pollen and nectar. Often those are ground nesting bees because ground nesting bees are thought to, uh, because they nest in the ground, they have to um, manipulate the ground and they sometimes will vibrate to move soil. Hmm. Um, whereas honeybees, they create their own wax that's, um, that uh, comes from their, their abdomen, lower abdomen. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of bees like bumblebees and some anthophora bees, digger bees like I showed the one nest cell of, um, they can actually what's called a buzz pollinate and buzz pollinating bees vibrate to the tune of mid C. Um, if you had a tuning fork, <laughs> if I had a tuning fork prop, I would do it now. Um, and that actually vibrates those flower anthers such the pollen comes out the shaker. Honeybees have a hard time with that. Honeybees may show up to a tomato, which have anthers like that or a rhododendron, and they may kind of karate chop, you know, <laughs> at the anther and a little will come out. It may not be enough for them to want to go back to the hive and make a, a wiggle dance, though, because it, you know, it's kind of hard. Um, are, this, these are just such funny images, you know, karate chopping bees and, and musical bees. And <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I will. Um, I think the next slide shows a great example of uh, what great thinkers have thought about bees. Um, now Einstein, of course, this is his bee proof right, on the chalkboard. Well, Einstein said, um, well, most people think, uh, I'm sorry, I need, to, I need to clarify, I'm getting, I'm moving so fast. So there's a quote misattributed to Einstein, that is, if the bee disappeared off the surface of the earth, man would have four years to live. So um, did he really say that? Actually, there's no proof, no concrete proof that he said that, but in his published writings, uh, he does indicate that bees are pollinators and they are a great example of codependence. And actually the laws of physics and biology lead us to understand that bees play an important role in pollination, both of wildflowers and our crops. Um, mm -hmm. So th while this quote uh, may be misattributed, um, it still has some relevance. The four years is something that uh, I don't think humankind would disappear off the planet within four years, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of plants that are uh, pollinated uh, by wind, by water, uh, or by flies, chocolate pollinated by flies, figs pollinated by wasps. Um, but if bees were to disappear off the face of the planet, we would see major ecological changes um, in our wild ecosystems and in our uh, agricultural yeah. ecosystems. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another great thinker, uh, is Darwin, and he had a lot to say about bees. And on this slide here, you can see a picture of Darwin um, with his, one of his sons. And he had his children work with him to um, study bumblebees. Uh, and from his experiments, uh, he writes, uh, from experiments which I've tried, I've found that the visits of bees, um, if not indispensable, are at least highly beneficial to the fertilization of our clovers. 
On the right there, you see a red clover. Darwin continues, but bumblebees alone visit the common red clover as other bees cannot reach the nectar. Hence, I have little doubt that if the whole genus of bumblebees became extinct or very rare, in England, the heart ease, which is the violet, and the red clover would become rare or, or wholly disappear. Now, to be fair, red clover can be pollinated by honeybees. Um, however, uh, it is difficult for the honeybee tongue to reach the nectar. Uh, so that uh, means that honeybees, if they find an easier uh, flower to sure. collect nectar from, they'll go there instead. Right, right. Um, whereas bumblebees have no problem and they will always visit the red clover if it's available. Now this is different than say crimson clover, which has longer inflorescences, but shorter flowers and honeybees love crimson clover. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, um, well, Darwin went on to say um, that um, mice, which eat bumblebee nests underground, uh, could be, are controlled by cats in England. So the more cats you have, the more bumblebees you might have. Well, the uh, relationship may not be quite so adversarial because bumblebees utilize underground old nests of mice, mm -hmm. and so benefit from mice presence as well. Um, people took this analogy of one of the first analogies of a food chain and indicated, wow, if it wasn't for the old cat ladies here in England, <laughs> we may not have the clover to feed the cows to feed the soldiers and we may not win the war. Go, <laughs> go old cat ladies. Um, so people have drawn this analogy out, but the idea is the complexity uh, surrounding bees and their ecology is important because underlying a lot of our food sources uh, are bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it makes the point well. Yeah, and actually in the 1880s, um, the bumblebee was introduced to New Zealand uh, where it's not native to um, because they're such good pollinators of clover and they weren't having the seed set that they wanted. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, another great thinker, of course, would be in this next slide here, I believe. We have another slide of a great thinker. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, we have a, uh, that's enough of the big thinkers for that. <laughs> Okay, um, but Darwin looked at orchid pollination as well and noticed that bees were important pollinators of orchids. And we have here in Oregon the uh, Calypso orchid. Now, Calypso uh, means uh, she that conceals. And Calypso orchids would never be pollinated by honeybees. Now, the reason for that is honeybees like to look for an area where, as I said, they can find uh, nectar uh, and pollen, um, or at least uh, an abundance of one of those. And these flowers don't have accessible nectar or pollen. The pollen is uh, hit up in a pollinia. There's no nectar produced by the plant whatsoever, and they tend to bloom in small groups. So uh, a honeybee, if they were to visit one of these beautiful pink flowers, they wouldn't go home and do a waggle dance and say, I know where, where, where to go. <laughs> I know where not to go is what they might be thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a honeybee um, will do a, a certain dance back at their hive to communicate to the other bees uh, where a floral resource would be, where a good source of pollen or nectar or both would be. Mm -hmm. And the bees can tell by the trajectory of the dance which way to go and the distance to go, um, as well as they can also um, sense pheromonically uh, some of the, uh, what flowers they may have been visiting in that location specifically. Mm -hmm. But this uh, Calypso orchid is pollinated by a native bee, the bumblebee. And uh, often bumblebee queens emerge in the spring and they'll visit enough of these flowers in a row before realizing they don't get anything. Um, because they're not uh, as picky um, in, the, in the early spring, you know, they keep getting fooled. And some of the reasons why it's been suggested is this flower actually has, sometimes they'll have a little bit yellow coloration, sometimes the pink pattern will be a little different in each one. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they're fooled thinking that it's a, uh, a different flower altogether, a different species of flower. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the abundance of flowers makes a huge difference in whether or not uh, bees are going to visit. And some of these bees with the smaller foraging ranges, um, can um, benefit tremendously by even small groups of uh, flowers like that we might do in our yard. It might mm -hmm. make a huge difference for the local bee population yeah. of native bees. Yeah. Um, so I think I have here a picture of a uh, crop, if we can talk about some crops, it's a tomato flower. Um, oh, so here we have is an example of bumblebees, which I said are such good pollinators that they can vibrate to that middle C. Um, well, Tomatoes require that buzz pollination. And so um, 
when they grow tomatoes in greenhouses, um, they need to have them pollinated. And sometimes people have big strings up running along and they'll shake them to get the, the pollen to shake out of the tomato. Yes. Um, other times uh, they would walk with a ha hand uh, battery operated uh, vibrator mm -hmm. to vibrate the plant's tomato seed. Well, people have figured out how to raise bumblebees in a um, laboratory setting and then put them in boxes, which they put in greenhouses. And the bumblebees will forage in there, but tomato plants don't produce any nectar. So they have to be given sugar water, um, like a kind of nectar substitute, mm -hmm. um, which isn't, n neither, neither of these things are especially preferable to bumblebees or any kind of bee that is having to have the same kind of pollen over and over again. So sometimes up to 70% of what bumblebees will collect will be from outside of the greenhouse. So while these bumblebees are incinerated at the end of the year, after they're done pollinating in a greenhouse. Incinerated? Mm -hmm, to prevent uh, disease spreading. Uh. Um, well, uh, they still forage outside of the hive and can spread disease. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later when I talk about the problems that face bees. Um, okay. the, an, another uh, pollination story is like our almond orchards or our pears and apples, uh, peaches, plums, these are all in the rose family. And here we see a picture of a mason bee. And I took this picture um, and it's such a good picture because it shows the pollen in the uh, um, scopa of this bee, which is on the bottom of the abdomen. Now mason bees are effective pollinators um, for this particular reason because they haven't packed the pollen and put it on the side of its body. It's actually um, relatively loose and right on the bottom square of the bee. So when the bee lands on a flower, the pollen is uh, Brought to, the brought to the stigma of the flower. Of course, these bees are also more effective uh, than honeybees per bee because they fly from tree to tree. They tend to fly from tree to tree, um, which means um, they are moving pollen from genetically different individuals, yes. um, which really helps. Seeds. Almonds are not self-fertile, mm -hmm. um, and a number of species are not self-fertile. So having pollen brought from a different tree is actually necessary. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, orchardists will plant uh, pollinizer, a tree of a different variety, um, along mm -hmm. with the, the variety that they want. Right, right. And you compare that to the next slide here, which is a honeybee. Um, and there's, a, I made a little example, a uh, bit of pollen on its uh, pollen basket there. But you can see the pollen is off to the side. It's packed tight. It's less likely to be transferred when the bee visits. Um, and it all, tends to go from flower to flower on the same tree. So per bee, honeybees are, have been estimated between five and a hundred times uh, less effective than a, a mason bee, um, but um, they still pollinate. They, they, they have the hairs that collect the pollen and they d do go from tree to tree occasionally, just a lot less often. Less effective for non-fertile, non-self-fertile plants. It is right, because of the foraging behavior, but also yeah. the, the pollen collecting behavior. Uh, uh, by putting it uh, pressed on the side of their leg means that they um, groom themselves in a way that means there's less pollen that's available to be transferred mm -hmm. for every flower they visit. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we also have an example of, uh, well, but, but then again, mason bees only go about 100 meters. And, uh, honeybees can go up to five miles uh, from their hive. So there are pros and cons to, to both. Yeah, yeah. But, oh, so, but together, if both bees are present in an orchard, there's actually uh, there's, uh, some papers published on uh, the synergy of these two bees working together because honeybees tend to go from tree to tree more often, affecting cross-pollination and fertilization of the fruit uh, more often if there are other uh, native uh, and or wild bees or you know, managed mason bees in that orchard. So it, th it, makes, it, it, make, it makes them more effective to have other bees around. So, there's so it's like they've got good role models. And <laughs> it's a, it's a posit positive synergy if you're looking for just fruit production, absolutely, yeah. That's okay. interesting. There are other examples of crops that uh, 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 honeybees are not as effective. Um, one of them is alfalfa. I believe we have an another slide of alfalfa. Um, oh, so actually, let's we'll talk about squash bees first. So on the right, we have... Um, uh, a picture of a couple flowers. Now squashes produce two types of flowers. One is a male flower, one is a female flower. And on the right, you see the female flower where the, with a uh, ovary that will develop into a large fruit. And the left is a male flower, which only produces, uh, uh, it, it will not, not produce a fruit. It has uh, pollen and uh, mm -hmm. nectar, but it doesn't have any ovules. Yeah. So squash bees 
are thought of as more effective than honeybees at pollinating squash because simply uh, the male bees will sleep in the flowers. They uh, will mate with female bees in the flowers. Uh, they wake up early in the morning when squash blooms blossom. Uh, they've actually evolved here in the Americas along with uh, the squash that people cultivate. Um, they, and they nest in the ground, often right around the squash plants. So it makes them very effective. Honeybees tend to wake up a little bit later during the day and they visit the flowers when the flowers are less receptive to oh. pollen. Uh, squash bees have those um, feathered hairs that allow mm -hmm. the capture of squash grains really effectively. Um, so that's an example of uh, their nesting and, and, and foraging and other types of behaviors that simply make them a better pollinator than honeybees. Squash bees were uh, brought to Hawaii um, to be uh, pollinators of uh, pumpkins and squash there, um, although they uh, did not survive that introduction. Um, the reason they were brought there is because honeybees uh, don't always do a good job of pollinating the uh, squash. And I suppose it makes sense that honeybees would be maybe less effective because they're not native here. You know, they, they were brought from Europe, right? Right, and well, a lot of our crops that we brought from Europe, uh, which is not the tomato, you know, which is, uh, you know, not the squash, you know, uh, but other crops uh, that have been brought here. Uh, so they would uh, do fine with the home plants, right. but not necessarily something that is native to this country right. or to this continent. Right, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yep. Leaf cutter bees are another example of bees that um, are effective in, in some crops more effective than uh, honey bees. And I believe a photo of a leaf cutter bee on a yellow flower. Um, and this um, photo shows um, the leafcutter bee, of course, has a scopa, its pollen broom on the bottom of its abdomen. Um, these bees, when they visit, um, so this actually is not a picture of, of alfalfa, but it's the closest picture I could find um, easily. The uh, alfalfa flowers are actually purple, but they're shaped similarly. And um, these bees, they're able to trip the flower, get pollen on themselves, and transfer pollen really effectively. Honeybees um, tend to visit alfalfa flowers and they're hit by the stamen and the anthers right on their head. And honeybees don't like that. And they find that that, that is uh, irritating because they're being hit on their head. Uh, so they end up finding a way, as they grow older, the foraging honeybees figure out a way to access the nectar from the side, which means that they don't uh, effectively pollinate alfalfa once they start doing that. So honeybees are used for alfalfa pollination and honeybees are brought in by massive quantities to do it because you need a large number of young honeybees to actually um, have enough foraging and pollinating if you're growing for alfalfa seed. Mm -hmm. um, but there are uh, groups, organizations, that uh, focus on the um, uh, leafcutter bee because they are really effective. There's a, a group that was called the, um, oh yeah, it's called the uh, Saskatchewan Alfalfa Seed Producers. Mm -hmm. Uh, they actually ended up changing their names to the Sask Leafcutters Association because the leafcutters are so effective at producing seed that they're, they're more effective to manage and easier than honeybees because they're not hit on the head by the stamen you know, when they visit. <laughs> so <laughs> That's another funny image, <laughs> mental image. Is, oh. <laughs> yeah. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we also have a native uh, bee that is uh, an important pollinator of alfalfa. This is Nomia melanderi. It's also called the alkali bee because it nests in alkaline soil substrates. Mm -hmm. And uh, as farming has uh, grown and people grew more and more areas of alfalfa in uh, northeastern Washington and such, um, they were destroying the underground habitat and nesting, excuse me, areas of the, of, uh, the uh, um, Nomia melanderi, mm -hmm. the alkali bee. And seed production went down and they recognize the connection and actually now there's huge areas where the uh, alkali bee is preserved and actually new habitat is created. Um, it's really complex because they try to maintain the exact perfect soil mo moisture and um, they tend to like a salty dry crust and uh, slightly moist under soil. Yes. Um, so there, and there can be thousands in like a square meter of these bees even though they're solitary they nest gregariously in the same area and they're really effective at pollinators. People have, uh, there's uh, speed limits to protect these bees in alfalfa seed growing areas uh, because these bees uh, do such a good job. And they're working on trying to uh, have the bees fly up and over the roads 
as the new roads are built. <laughs> How are you trying to be to do that? Well, they're putting up uh, fences and experimenting with having the bees, they find a little net fence uh -huh. where they have to fly up and over above the car level. Um, but they're important and they're... Uh, Hey, if it's a key to your economy, I guess you're going to do what you need to do to protect them. Right, yeah. yeah. You see the slide there. Um, there's actually a number of areas that have these speed limit signs uh, and speed limits enforced on the alkali bees. Um, well, they carry the pollen on, on the, their leg. Um, they uh, do a great job pollinating. and They nest underground as well, as I mentioned. I, I want to make sure that you have enough time to talk about so everything that you wanted to touch on, including you know, problems and solutions. Okay. So I'm wondering if maybe we should move on to talking about the problems that bees are facing. Sure, yeah. Um, so Carl Linnaeus um, named the honeybee Apis mellifera, which means honey uh, gatherer, honey bearer. Um, but during that time, people were learning a lot about honeybees, and Carl Linnaeus even had a beekeeping brother um, that may have try to clue them in mm -hmm. about um, how actually uh, these bees um, actually gather nectar and they make the honey back home. They kind of concentrate it. Now, um, what that means is really, you look at like uh, 50 years ago, um, uh, Rachel Carson wrote in her book, Silent Spring, that the world of systemic insecticides is a weird world. And she indicated that it's a world where a honeybee can carry poisonous nectar um, back from the field and make poisonous honey in the hive. And that bioconcentration that Carl Linnaeus recognized, that uh, Rachel Carson recognized, is something that's real and, and it affects us here locally and bees locally. Um, we had in Portland in 2013 and in Eugene in 2014, both times during National Pollinator Week, uh, uh, pesticide, uh, neo neonicotinoid, mm -hmm. uh, systemic pesticide. The systemic pesticide meaning it goes throughout the whole plant and the nectar and the pollen mm -hmm. um, that was uh, misapplied during the blooming time of the linden tree. Yeah. Now, Carl Linnaeus himself was named after the linden tree. Now, these bees were uh, uh, exposed to lethal doses, and what's called lethal dose. That means they died right away. Um, but these upcoming years, because those insecticides will still be in the tree, bees visiting will be getting sublethal doses. Oh, and then carrying it back to mm -hmm. their and, and hive. Concent and yeah. concentrating it back in the hive if they're yeah. social bees. So that's the danger uh, with uh, systemic insecticides. And that's also the danger with the way uh, the uh, EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, monitors the uh, uh, safety of insecticides, um, which are more appropriately called biocides. You think of DDT was an insecticide, but it didn't just kill insects that also kill birds and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, lethal dose and lethal concentration is when uh, they, they uh, expose the bees to various levels of these insecticides. And when approximately 50% of the colony dies uh, within approximately a week, the average study is about a week, then uh, that's the lethal dose. And you have to apply less than that. What isn't looked at within the current uh, safety assessment scheme are uh, the synergistic effects, the um, sublethal dosages. Um, of course, we know, uh, you know, what, what's, uh, we have a, like a, you know, limit on how much alcohol we can have in our bloodstream as we drive down the road. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, you know, do we fall over dead? Because it impacts a whole bunch of other people. Yes. Um, and the behavior, the cognitive abilities, the foraging distance, you know, capabilities, um, the, there are synergistic effects with other drugs. Uh, these are all things that affect bees. And some bees are actually more sensitive than others. Um, I think I have another slide here that will help us uh, move forward. The next slide here actually shows, uh, this is a gene on the left in the expression of the, the gene level in, a, uh, when, uh, in the honeybee when exposed to these neonicotinoid pesticides on the, on the right. Um, so, this expression level shows that the, uh, this gene basically would have a low expression level if the bee was having uh, a good immune response. But it has a high level when exposed in the treated bees, treated with that insecticide, um, at a field realistic level. Uh, their immune system is compromised, and that's, that's what that indicates, that high level. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's really high. So what that means is when they have a, a, a compromised immune system, um, they can have uh, more susceptibility to things like deformed wing virus. And in this study, 
uh, which was titled, uh, I'll find the title here, Neonicotinoid Clothianidin Adversely Affects Insect Immunity and Promotes Replication of a Viral Pathogen in Honeybees. It's a 2013 study. Um, the next slide shows how the um, compromised immunity allowed the uh, deformed wing virus, which is when these honeybees get very small wings when, they're, when they emerge, which means they can't fly very far and they'll have to you know, stay within the hive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that virus replicated much higher uh, in the presence of these insecticides. Now that's not something the EPA asked the manufacturers to do a safety study on, you know, uh, when, when they determine whether or not something be used in the field. Um, but it's a realistic scenario um, that people can identify. Now another picture shows just the number of pesticides that these bees are exposed to. Um, this study is called Crop Pollination Exposes Honeybees to Pesticides Which Alter Susceptibility to the Gut Pathogen Nosema serrani. This is a 2013 paper. Nosema is a fungi that uh, is associated um, and sometimes implicated as a, as a component of colony collapse disorder. It makes bees unhealthy. Um, Nosema, this, this fungus, uh, occurred at higher levels um, when bees were exposed to um, uh, harmful fun fungicides. Uh, bees are often exposed to dozens of different pesticides. And so looking at the synergistic effects of those is really important because uh, they, can, they can impact bees negatively. In this case, um, being exposed to multiple fungicides uh, and other pesticides made the bees more susceptible to a harmful fungi. And actually, bee bread, which is when bees uh, collect the pollen, they put it uh, in the hive, you know, it's just what, what they're going to be eating. Mm -hmm. There's a large number of beneficial fungi inside the bee bread that the bees uh, um, benefit from um, because it prevents harmful fungi like chalk brood. Um, but when bees forage on orchards that have had uh, fungicide sprayed earlier in the year, uh, they end up bringing back that fungicide and it harms the diversity of beneficial fungi within the colony. And so uh, chalk brood is associated with bees foraging on uh, previously sprayed uh, orchards. Um, so there's a lot of uh, unintended consequences that, that are uh, not associated with direct bee death, but sublethal effects that affect overall colony strength as far as honeybees go. So it sounds like bees are just as susceptible to microflora imbalances as people are. And, and then they can suffer illness or, or death, just right. like people can right. when their bacteria, the inter internal bacteria get out of balance. Yeah, bees have an intestinal flora that's beneficial. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, you know, seeing them as a mirror is, is uh, totally appropriate, mm -hmm. as has been suggested by Dr. Spivak. This is uh, a way for us to think realistically about bees. They're complex organisms. Some of them are social, uh, which means that they rely on social cues about what genes to turn on and off. Uh, bees turn on, uh, on and off hundreds, if not thousands of genes to know whether they should be foraging in the field, uh, defending the hive, taking care of the queen, feeding young, uh, building wax comb. Um, and those genes are turning on and off. And uh, there are nutritional requirements for the, that process. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have bees that are foraging on a diverse set of pollen uh, and al allowing that pollen to uh, have beneficial fungi protecting it in the hive, mm -hmm. uh, bees are going to be less healthy. So because uh, we're getting low on time yeah. uh, and we've, we've talked about all of the, the rather large challenges that are facing bees. Sure. Why don't we talk now about solutions? I want to be sure that we end on a, a positive as, note as possible, yeah. as positive as possible. Well, a lot of the things we can do for bees involve planting a diverse set of flowers. Native flowers work great for native bees. Mm -hmm. uh, they will uh, work wonderfully for native bees. So different f colors, different shapes, different sizes, different blooming times. Um, bees emerge, different types of bees emerge from spring all the way till early fall. Um, and so having flowers that bloom for them at every time of the year is important. And there are native plants that honeybees um, can't really access the pollen or nectar, but other bees can. And that makes them kind of unique. The, the, the native bees can get there and the, the, the pollen and nectar won't be missing. Um, you know, uh, there are um, studies that show that honeybee presence can reduce the success of bumblebee colonies because sometimes they do forage on the same flower. Mm -hmm. As I've shown, the bumblebees are really important. So having that diversity of flowers uh, that uh, allows the bees to forage throughout the year 
and um, everyone having a chance. Small things make a difference. A yard full of flowers will attract lots of bees having no-till areas. I believe I've got a cool picture of a, um, what, what farming can do to bees um, here. Let's see if we can pull that up. But uh, because bees nest underground, anything that we um, do uh, tilling can affect their nesting. And um, yep, um, I think another thing to point out is we've thought about bees being, um, hun honeybees being the sole s provider of our food pollination, whereas the bee diversity um, is really what's behind both our wallflower and food pollination, um, food crop pollination. So ensuring that we, we have studies that reflect the um, native bees and their susceptibility to pesticides, um, ensuring that we um, are active in using less if not eliminating pesticide uh, acti activity and use when we can will ensure that uh, these sensitive creatures uh, are allowed to you know um, be healthy and that means educating the public yeah i think education is a, an important component you know and i have some educational tools here i can show real quick so we'll see what i can fit in here so i think um so the w w way bees see the world may be different than the way we see the world. So you may be seeing this on my hand, which you can see my hand. Um, I don't see anything. There's nothing, hand. nothing. <laughs> but bees may be seeing this. Oh, cool. See, the, the bees see an ultraviolet light. So sometimes we just need to recognize that the way bees see the world and the way we see the world isn't the same. And the more we understand bees and bee diversity, the more we can do things that help them. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we can do is identify what bees are in our local area. This little contraption uh, I built with a friend, it's simply plexiglass. You scoop a bee in a net, you put this in the net, slide the top on, push the little foam up, and the bee can't fly out. You can take a picture of the bee for identification later. And using that identification, you can often identify the family, possibly the genus of the bee, and identify what kind of nesting substrate it would use, what kind of flowers it would benefit from. Mm -hmm. And the bee survives. And, uh, and everybody's happy. Everybody, everybody can be happy. You know, <laughs> more wildflower and crop pollination, for yeah. sure. Um, so do you have any more questions? Um, I'm wondering if you've got any, uh, this is just one question. If, do you have any good ideas for spreading the word in the public about not using pesticides when plants are blooming? Because it seems like if just that step were taken, uh, it would go a long way toward helping to protect bees and, and other pollinators, of course. Right, emphasizing again that systemic insecticides uh, are in a... And define again systemic. Systemic in insecticides are insecticides that go throughout the system of a plant uh, which means it can be in the pollen, it can be in the nectar. Um, and if it's a perennial plant, uh, depending on the half-life of that chemical, it could be there the next year even. So wow. uh, I think the, it's important to not apply when things are blooming, but also it's important to recognize in long-lived perennial plants, um, there can be an accumulation of different uh, insecticides that build up mm -hmm. in that. And in fact, some of these chemicals, they're, um, as they degrade, uh, what they degrade into can be hundreds of times more lethal. So what that means is, you know, when we do a safety assessment of the initial uh, ingredient, active ingredient, we also need to think about what it breaks down into and how that's affecting bees. You know, bees that nest in the ground when we do soil drenching, you know, mm -hmm. are get exposed to higher levels than bees that are, have a beekeeper who is uh, removing the bees from the area because they've been informed of uh, uh, pesticide application. Our wild bees don't have a representative to protect them in those kind of situations. So education to farmers, education to uh, everyone, I think would be most helpful. Yeah, we try to, in the ma among the master gardeners, we try to spread the word as much as we can uh, about uh, being careful not to, not only not to use pesticide applications when bees are feeding, but um, just to read the instructions. You know, don't use anything until you have read the instructions. Yeah. Some of the ways, is it, this is a toxic sure. you know, material. Sure, some of the ways people misinterpreted possibly the uh, uh, neonicotinoids used on the linden trees um, mm -hmm. was do not apply while crop is blooming or about to bloom. Of course, linden trees aren't a crop for people, but for hundreds of years they've been an important 
honey crop for honeybees mm -hmm. and recognize it's producing wonderful honey. And when we see honey as a crop, when we see, you know, bees as something to protect themselves, you know, um, as you part know, of bringing in the crop, right? Yeah. Then, uh, you know, and recognizing that even if it's not a food crop, you know, that uh, it's still important for bees and people somewhere. Um, then I think we'll, we'll be better set for protecting bees. Well, you know, j talking about protecting bees, I, this this brings up the whole issue of colony collapse disorder, which you touched on early on. Tell us more about that and what, what the average person, the average gardener uh, can do to help. Well, I think there's an interesting study that came out recently uh, that shows a lot of the plants we buy that are bee friendly in stores mm -hmm. actually have been treated by neonicotinoid pesticides, which may be affecting the uh, foraging efficiency and the health of the bees that visit them. So it's important to make sure that the plants you plant out uh, don't have these dangerous chemicals. Um, as far as colony collapse disorder goes, um, there's a lot of different uh, potential causes and there's a lot of different definitions of what colony collapse disorder is. So I think when we uh, approach bee health from the standpoint of that there's a diversity of bees, not all of them are in colonies, and the ones that are in colonies uh, have a really complex system that it's not easy to have a one point solution. Rather, we need to um, ensure that they have a healthy forage we need to ensure that they're not overexposed to pesticides. We need to look at synergistic effect between uh, poor forage and sublethal pesticide exposure. Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things will help us solve the problem, whether it's colony collapse disorder uh, or any other ones. The colony collapse disorder did occur, uh, became first recorded around 2006, which is after the pollination needs in America outweighed the number of honeybees, such that we allowed international importation of uh, honeybees at that point. So that was 2005, and in 2006 we find colony collapse disorder. Some of the problems is treating bees uh, as um, an economic resource to make money from, um, and there's there's a high value in you know uh, having them pollinate crops and selling the honey. However, when we take that natural nutrition, that honey away, and we um, give them like soy flour protein as a, as a uh, substitute mm -hmm. for the uh, bee pollen, uh, the bees are uh, less healthy and um, that contributes to bee losses. We've actually had an increase in the number of bee colonies, uh, managed honeybee colonies in the United States, but we also have increases in the number of losses during the winter. So while we can keep replicating and selling bees to each other, um, we need to look at the bees that don't have anyone uh, taking care of them as well, so the wild bees. Brian, I want to thank you for uh, being with us today. This has been absolutely fascinating. I think there was so much more that we could have talked about if we had had the time for it. Sure. Um, uh, I hope that, that the screen has already uh, given your Facebook uh, address that has more information. If not, we, we need to get that up on the screen. Um, this has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for folks with grass-stained knees. Join us next week as we further explore the world outside our back door. See you then. Thank you for the interview.